Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us on the last day of Library Research Week 2023. And our theme for today is energizing your inner power. We have a very short day today, so it will only be three sessions. And um, our first speaker is Mr. Samuel Simango. He is the manager of the research data services of the library um, Stellenbosch University's Library and Information Service. And in his role, he has been involved in the conceptualization and the implementation of several research data management initiatives at the university, such as drafting governments, governance documents related to research data, managing the institutional research data repository, and provide, providing data management planning as well as research data support services. In addition to this, he has um, he was involved in the open science component of ILUFU. I'm not sure if I am pronouncing this correctly, um, Sam. Um, the big data infrastructure for data intensive research and served as one of the developers of the research data management. Uh, management adventure game. Um, Sam, very welcome here this morning, as well as welcome to all the other participants uh, um, for today's session. And I'm handing you over to Sam now. But Sam, before you start, just want to remind everybody that um, the chat service is there for them to pose questions or raise any comments or um, issues pertaining to the particular session. Um, be advised that the, the webinar will be recorded and it will be available on the library's YouTube channel. We will post that um, link to the channel just now. And yeah, so the chat service is there for any to pose any questions. Over to you, Sam. Welcome, um, ladies and gentlemen, to um, this presentation. Um, Alvina has already introduced me, so I won't go into the details about who I am. The presentation itself is um, on open data and resource data management. And before I proceed, I just want to thank everyone for showing up today. You could have been anywhere else in the world, but you chose to be here, even if it's virtually. And for that, I'm obviously grateful. Now, the presentation itself deals with um, open data and resource data management, as I pointed out. And before I start, I just want to point out resource data management is a concept that generally invokes associations with open science, open access, and open data. Now, although all of these concepts are indeed related in some way, they cannot be equated with one another, as this would amount to false equivalence. So this session aims to clarify that relationship between open data and resource data management. Now, in terms of the outcomes, there's several outcomes. Firstly, um, attendees can expect to learn the following. The place of open data as a concept, the place that it, um, it occupies within the context of open science, the relationship between resource data management and open science, the relationship between resource data management and open data, the quality related aspects associated with resource data management, the relationship between resource data management and the fair data principles. How one goes from implementing resource data management all the way to open data. And then finally, how to use different tools in order to ensure that open data actually do comply with the fair data principles. So let's look at the structure of the presentation itself. In terms of the overview, the presentation will be structured as follows. Firstly, I'll cover the foundational aspects of open data and resource data management. Then I'll proceed to cover the quality management aspects of resource data management. I'll then move on to cover resource data management and the fair data principles. Then I'll uh, proceed to cover how we can actually go from resource data management and wind up at um, open data before finally concluding um, by showcasing the tools that support open fair data compliance. Now let's start with the first point, foundational aspects of open data and resource data management. <laughs> the starting point is actually open science. I want to start by asking the question, what is open science? 
Well, the term itself lacks an official definition, to be honest. So what I did is actually had a look at um, some research and I came across a definition that was postulated by Vicentes Ayas and Martinez Fuentes. And um, they defined open science as transparent and accessible knowledge that is shared and developed through collaborative networks. So this was a definition that was synthesized by going through the literature that covered open science. Now, if we look at a taxonomy that was um, generated by um, Foster as a company, um, open science seems it's basically an umbrella concept. And if you look closely enough, you'll see that open data is a component that falls under open science. And it has its own subcategories too. What you will not see in this um, diagram is um, resource data management. Now, Foster has um, a taxonomy for resource data management as well, and you see that it actually consists of various subcomponents such as data management plans, RDM policies, services, standards, and tools. So you start seeing a bit of a discrepancy, a difference between resource data management on the one hand and open data particularly because open data is associated with open science, whereas the relationship between research data management and open science is not so apparent just by looking at these two taxonomies. But <clears throat> what we can gather, is, as I indicated, is that open data would be a component of the umbrella concept of open science. Now, to be um, more clear, there are some overlaps between research data management and um, open data at certain points. However, the key takeaway that I want you to grasp from this is that research data management is not the same thing as open data. So before we consider what research data management is, we should at least start by considering what research data actually are. Research data management, uh, sorry, research data can be defined as any data that are collected or generated for the purpose of analysis in order to generate or validate scientific claims. Scientific claims. If you look at the image on the slide right now, you see the different forms that research uh, data can actually take on. For instance, you can have audio files, text files, images, visualizations, video files. These would all form constitute um, some form of research data. Now, generally speaking, uh, research data uh, management is depicted in the form of some form of a resource data um, life cycle. And you can see different examples of um, several research data life cycles on the current slide. There's a far more simple one that I prefer to use, though. And if we just have a look at the um, difference between the resource life cycle and the data life cycle, we can actually understand the nature of um, the research data life cycle a bit more. So on the left hand side of the screen, which sees the resource life cycle, which tracks what you can view as the, the life cycle of a research output, such as a, a journal paper. So in this case, someone actually um, conducts a literature review, they conduct the research, they collect the data, analyze the data, and then they publish a research output, such as a journal article. But if you look at the resource data life cycle on the right hand side, what you'll see is that the focus is primarily on the research data themselves from the moment where the research data are collected, processed, analyzed, and then when the research project comes to an end, the data are published, curated, and eventually they are reused. Now, there are clearly some overlaps between these two um, different life cycles, but it should be apparent what the focus of the research data life cycle is. Now, a key thing that you don't see here is that the research data, uh, or at least research data management, also takes into consideration what is known as data management planning. That is um, a description of the manner in which um, a research plans to manage the research, a researcher plans to manage the research data during as well as after a research project. So you can add this to the five stage on research data life cycle, end up with a six stage research data management life cycle. From that, we can actually distill a working definition of research data management. And in this sense, research data management can actually be defined as a process that entails two things. Firstly, planning for the manner in which resource data will be managed during and after a research project. And secondly, controlling the collection, processing, analysis, sharing, dissemination, 
curation and reuse of resource data. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, I haven't actually seen a bit of the difference between resource data management and open data in this sense. We can now move on to consider the quality management aspects of resource data management. So first of all, what is quality? Well, quality can be defined in this sense as an attribute or property characteristic of an object. So within the context of this presentation, you'd be looking at the attributes of prop or properties associated with resource data. To understand this a bit more, we need to actually consider the goals of resource data management. And there are three goals that researchers need to be cognizant of in this sense. Firstly, the first goal is to assure that data are capable of supporting analysis. So you collect your data and you want to analyze the data, generate some output, the resource data management should actually support that. Secondly, to assure that all operations performed on the data are traceable. So whatever you do, um, whatever uh, calculations or manipulations or analysis, anything that you do, any tests that you perform on the resource data should be traceable. There should be a provenance record and you should be able to tell what is actually being done to the resource data. And finally, to facilitate use of data by people other than those involved in their original collection, management and analysis. This can be during as well as after the completion of a research project, but the first two goals are primarily associated with tests that are performed during the course of an actual research project and not necessarily afterwards. Now, the key words that I want you to take note of are assure, at least it's the key word rather, that actually occurs twice. Now, whenever you're dealing with something such as assurance, that actually is something that is associated with quality. And whenever quality assurance needs to be addressed, that also implies that some form of quality control must also uh, be in place because quality assurance and quality control are both tenets of quality management. Now, what you see now on this slide is um, an example taken from the ISO 25012 that applies to data quality. I should point out that this does not necessarily apply specifically to research data as such, but it can give you a good indication of what the quality attributes associated with research data are. For instance, if you look at the attributes here, you see things such as completeness, precision, accuracy, consistency, currency, understandability, manageability, credibility, quality. I don't know why they included quality, but at least regulatory compliance. All of those are some form of attributes associated with the nature of the, um, of the data in question. And some of those are actually applicable to resource data as well. <laughs> now, let's consider resource data management and the FAIR data principles. Now, the FAIR data principles serve as some form of quality barometer associated with uh, resource data. Um, I showed you the ISO previously and I indicated that it does not necessarily apply specifically to resource data. Well, there is something, the FAIR data principles, which applies specifically to resource data. Now, FAIR in this case is an acronym which stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Now, each principle in this case actually has sub subcomponents. And um, I'll cover this broadly and then just unpack it very, very briefly as well. The findability aspect relates to the degree to which people can actually find, at least locate uh, resource data. So you don't want resource data to be stored on um, secondary storage devices such as a flash stick, a memory card, an external hard drive, where people can actually not find it. You'd rather if people can actually conduct this online search on the internet and actually locate the resource data in question. Secondly, accessibility. The research data should be accessible in the sense that one shouldn't have to be forced to pay in order to access, at least to gain access to the research data. So the data should be openly accessible in that sense. Thirdly, there's an issue of interoperability. There should be some kind of control vocabulary that is actually applied to the research data so that um, at least the metadata can be exchanged and interpreted and that they are actually understood not just by humans, but by computer systems as well. <clears throat> 
and then there's a reusability aspect which applies to the data as well as the um, metadata. Generally, at least broadly speaking, the metadata should be clear enough and include some form of a usage license that allows other people to um, make use of the resource data. Generally speaking, this can be something such as a Creative Commons uh, data related license that allows people to make use of the data, provided that they acknowledge the original creator of the research data in question. Now, let's just go into a bit more detail with regards to the fair data principles. If we look at the findability aspect, in order for someone to actually find the data, they should be able to make use of a persistent identifier, such as a DOI, that is a digital object identifier. The metadata associated with the, risk, with the uh, data should actually be rich and quite descriptive enough, and it should be possible for the, um, the data to actually be indexed in some form of a repository. Furthermore, the metadata should actually include the persistent identifier. If we look at the accessibility, <clears throat> the data should actually be accessible by using some form of a standard communications protocol. Um, this can generally refer to something such as uh, the TCP IP um, protocols, that is a transmission communication protocol, the internet protocol. So broadly speaking, you should be able to find these things on the internet and people should only have to authenticate where that's necessary. And lastly, the metadata should also be available. So there are circumstances under which resource data might not necessarily be accessible. The data may be sensitive in nature due to several reasons. However, the metadata associated with the research data should at least be publicly accessible, nevertheless. When we look at the interoperability principle, we are considering things such as controlled vocabularies, and essentially you use standardized terms to describe the research data. Generally, this would be things that are standardized at a discipline level um, at the very least, and these vocabularies should be fair, and they should support some form of linked metadata. In the same way that you'd have a semantic web, you'd also want the metadata to be linked semantically. And then finally, there's the issue of reusability. In this case, the metadata should have several attributes. They should include a usage license, which is what I mentioned previously. If it's resource data, then you'd want something such as a Creative Commons license. If you're using software, resource software, you'd want to make use of an open source license. And there should be a provenance trail that allows people to actually understand how the data were actually generated, the different tests or operations that were performed on the data, and the research data should actually comply, at least um, they should comply with certain community standards, at least they should be generated in a manner that complies with community standards that makes it possible for other people to understand the research data and therefore make use of the research data. Um, if there are any questions before I proceed, feel free to actually raise them. Are there any questions before I carry on to the next section? Um, not at the moment, Sam. All right, thank you very much, Alvina. All right, so now I'll describe how we go from resource data management to open data. So remember I pointed out that there are three goals of resource data management that researchers need to be cognizant of. And I did allude to the fact that some of them are applicable to the active phase of the research project. That is um, the phase in which a researcher conducts the research project. And then that the third one is really associated with what happens after the project has come to a conclusion. So it is the third goal, the facilitation of reuse of the data by other people that is primarily associated with open data. So if we have a look at the research data management lifecycle, the researcher will start off by creating a data management plan and plan how they'll manage their research data, collect their data, process and analyze the data, and then they'll share and disseminate the data. The data will be curated and then the data will be reused. <laughs> Now, there are several ways through which research data can actually be um, published or at least be made open and accessible as open data. Firstly, researchers can actually publish supplementary data along with a journal article. Secondly, research data can be published separately 
as data papers that are published in data journals. These data papers are actually peer reviewed research outputs in their own right. And thirdly, research data can actually be deposited into research data repositories. These may be domain specific repositories or they can be generic uh, data repositories. A subset of these generic um, or multidisciplinary um, repositories is an institutional research data repository. An example that you see here is Sun Scholar Data, which is done on Boston University's institutional research data repository. Now, the main idea in trying to make data open is the fact that you want to go from moving data from a state where the data are um, not reusable to a state where they can be openly accessible and functionally linked. So way, the way that it works is that, generally speaking, a large portion of the resource data that are generated are not necessarily reusable. That's primarily because they lack um, metadata, uh, or at least adequate metadata, as well as things such as the PIDs, the persistent identifiers. So if you look at A here, this box here, you find that a data set that does not have an identifier, any metadata, and obviously if there's no data, that is completely um, useless. The research data can be findable, at least the content can be findable, if it has some form of a persistent identifier, such as a DOI. Things get better if you go to the next block here, block C, which has the persistent identifier that is included along with the metadata that describes the research data. In that case, we have fair metadata, but the data set itself, the data elements, is actually not fair compliant. If we move down here to block D, we find a case where you have a case of existing research data, but the data are actually restricted. In this case, you'd be dealing with, let's say, sensitive research data that could be sensitive on the, um, based on the grounds of data privacy, could be due to research contract um, obligations, as well as intellectual property restrictions. So in that case, the research data would actually not be publicly accessible. However, the metadata that describes the data would be publicly accessible, and they would include a persistent identifier. Things get even better when we move to block E. In this case, that's when you're dealing with research data that are actually not sensitive in nature and have actually been published along with their associated metadata that would include a persistent identifier. In that case, you'd be dealing with fair data that are openly accessible. So this is an example of open data. But the final, final stage that you want to be at is a case where you have your data, associated metadata that are public and the metadata include the persistent identifier and that the research data is actually functionally linked with any other data set, set that is associated with it that has been published um, publicly or that has some publicly available metadata so that you can actually see the links between various data sets that exist because research data do not necessarily just exist in isolation. So this would be an example of a data set that appears as if it exists in isolation, but you cannot see the relationship between the data set generated from this specific research project and any other associated research data sets that were generated from affiliated research projects or similar research projects. So what you'll find then, if I was briefly summarize or simplify this is that you have cases where you find that research data are not actually open. So if we look at this quadrant here, you can see the intersection between fairness and openness. On the left hand side, the top left hand side, you see that you have research data that have been made open and accessible, but they're not fair compliant. So you can have open data in this case that are of a low quality because they don't comply with the fair data principles. And if you go down here to the bottom left quadrant, what you find is research data that are closed, at least they're not publicly accessible. So this is clearly not a case of open data. And furthermore, the research data do not even comply with um, the fair data principles. So this is the worst category you can actually be in. And to be honest, none of the um, options on the left hand side of this quadrant are actually optimal in any case. What you really want is the case where you have research data that are actually open and compliant with fair data principles. So this would be a good example of open data, open data that are actually fair. That's the 
um, quadrant that's on the top right hand side. Now, even though this is the optimal situation you'd want to be in, I must confess that this is not always possible. There are instances where resource data have to be close due to data privacy reasons, resource contract issues, intellectual property restrictions. These are things that I've mentioned previously, so this would actually be a compromise in which case the research data would not be open, but they would be fair compliant. And at this point, you can really see the difference between open data and resource data management. Both of these quadrants um, comprise of research data that have actually been managed well in accordance with the principles of research data management, but it's only the data sets that are actually in the top right hand side of the quadrant that would actually be openly accessible and would therefore fall within the category of open data. Nevertheless, for the bottom category here, the closed and fair data sets, you'd at least want the metadata associated with the resource data to be publicly accessible. Sam? Uh, yes. Um, there is a question. I don't know if you first want to con um, finish this section and then answer this question. Come back um, to this question. Um, I can I can feel it right now because I was just about to start off with the tools. Um, what's the question? Okay. <laughs> um, Mr. Luzwazi, I'm not sure if I could uh, pronounce your surname correctly. He asked, Greetings, when writing a research proposal, which resources are recommended to find information in terms of data management plan? Oh. Well, sort of I preempted the very next thing that I'm going to cover. I think I'll, I'll answer that um, going forward right now. You'd use um, data management planning software. In fact, that's probably the first thing that I'll cover right now. If after I finish this section, you feel as if I still haven't answered that question, then please raise that question again. But I do believe that I'll answer it in the next five slides. Um, so is there any other question there? No, thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, so data management planning is something that I'm going to address in the next five slides. <clears throat> and I'll show you the an example of specific tool that you can use um, for such purposes. So let's look at the tools that support open fair data compliance. <clears throat> there are four tools that I'll cover in this sense. Data Stewardship Wizard, which is a data management planning tool. Sound Scholar Data, which is an institutional research data repository. And then there are two tools that actually assess the degree to which research data sets comply with the fair data principles. The first one is the Fuji Automated Fair Data Assessment Tool, and the second one is the Fair Evaluator Tool. So let's start off with Data Stewardship Wizard. And this will be a brief overview. I cannot go into the data aspects. Um, so there's someone whose mic is not on. Uh, would you mind just muting yourself, please? Thank you. All right, thanks, Alvina. All right, so as I indicated, Data Storage Wizard is a um, data uh, management planning software. It was created by a company known as CodeFence, and it allows researchers to generate data management plans. It's a very good tool. I believe it's the best one on the market. And the way it works is it allows researchers to complete a questionnaire. They call it a smart form. And this smart form takes researchers through the research um, data management lifecycle. And then it allows researchers to basically um, fill in or at least complete certain questions. So for example, in this case, researchers will actually indicate what kind of data formats they'll be using. And um, what you'll see is that this is an integration question here that is linked to a tool known as fair sharing. And so these are things that are built into um, data storage wizard. So to answer the question that was raised right now, what you'll find is that if you find a good data management planning software such as data storage wizard, it will actually connect you to relevant resources that you will need for data management planning purposes. So for instance, if you want to select a repository to, in which you want to uh, deposit your research data after you've completed your research project, there would be a question um, when, when you come to the seventh chapter here, seventh category, given access to data, and you would be able to select the data repository. 
there's a drop down menu, kind of like what you see here, and you can even select some scholar data by way of example. So even if you didn't know existing um, data repositories, you can see them in the list. Some of them would be more relevant to your discipline and you could actually um, select them. So a good tool such as Data Storage Wizard can actually point you to good data management planning resources. It does have things such as um, there's an integrated book that shows you the do's and don'ts, and um, it does actually have a few resources that it can actually point you to. So that would be, I just basically expanded on that to address the question that was asked previously. Now, the tool, like in this case, Data Storage Wizard, has several templates. It has a few temp templates that can be used to generate a data management plan. So you don't just generate the plan from scratch, you work with a DMP template. In this case, this is a template generated by Science Europe, which is a consortium of Arise funders in Europe. And this is known as the core requirements for data management plans. It has a few questions and they cover six broad categories. Firstly, you describe the manner in which your data will be collected and reused, how you document and manage the quality of the research data, um, this, how you store and back up the data, any legal and ethical requirements, how the data will be shared and um, preserved in the long term, and finally, who will be responsible for managing the research data. So if you complete a template such as this, using data storage wizard, it will ultimately generate a DMP that looks kind of like what you see here. This is a demonstration data management plan based on a make-believe project, hence the name make-believe project. And if you look very closely, you'll see that these are the same questions that you saw um, when you looked at the core requirements for a data management plan. I won't go into the details here, we'll just look very briefly what the DMP looks like. But this is the actual data management plan, which can be exported as a PDF or a Word document, and then you can actually edit the, the content itself. Now, what is important about this tool, um, Data Storage Wizard, is that it allows people to comply with the fair data principles in a very unique way. So if you look at the core requirements for data management plans, you notice that there were sub questions there, and each of these sub questions can be mapped to a specific sub component of the fair data principles. So if you look at the findable principle, it has four sub components that are connected to a specific core requirement for DMPs. And what this basically indicates is that if you were to complete a data management plan that is based on the core requirements for DMPs, you would essentially generate a data management plan that is compliant with the fair data principles. But that's not all, there's more. You look at the data storage wizard, it generates fair metrics that then show you the degree to which your data management plan complies with the fair data principles. So it will generate metrics on definability, accessibility, reusability, interoperability, even if though you don't see that here, as well as other attributes such as good data management practices, the degree to which your DMP complies with those, as well as the degree to which it supports the openness of the research data. So once again, these are the quality attributes associated with the research data being, um, being aligned with the fair data principles. Now, the tool does then generate a summary report of these metrics. So there's a summary report of the overall data management plan that actually addresses the degree to which, and these metrics in this case are for that mock data management plan, the demonstration data management plan that I actually showed you. So as you can see, there's a score for the findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. And this is based on a weighted score that ranges from zero to one. So if you have one score of one, that's very good. And obviously zero on the dot is terrible. So if you look at 0 0.80, that's actually not quite bad. And um, you can actually look at this graphically if you look at the radar graph right here to see that um, overall the data management plan does comply with the fair data principles to a large degree. But beyond that, Data Storage Wizard also allows you to go in on a more granular level. If you look at um, the various components of the data management plan, such as the administrative information, the reuse of the data, the creation and collection of the data, how the data will be processed, interpreted, preserved, 
how you provide access to the data. Remember, these are all components of the resource data management lifecycle, and the tool allows you to answer questions based on each section of the lifecycle, and it goes into granular details with regards to the questions. So these metrics provide a broad overview of the DMP, as well as a more detailed granular description of the degree to which each section has complied with the fair data principles. And if you have a look at the degree to which the data will be preserved, you will notice that the data would be findable, it will be accessible, and they do comply with the good DMP practice how practices. However, if you look at the reusability, you see that it's red, which indicates that it has a very low rating, and you can see that the score is 0 0.15. Is very low, and that is also reflected on the radar graph here. So that indicates that the reusability of the resource data would actually have to be addressed before just moving on to actually preserve the data because that's a very low score right there. Um, before I continue, um, to the person who asked the questions uh, relating to data management plan, I just want to verify whether or not I've actually answered your question. Mr. Luzwazi, uh, has your question been answered? You can unmute yourself. Mr. Luzwazi, you can unmute yourself. Hello. Hello. Greetings, this is uh, Luswazi. Uh, <clears throat> Prof, I think I am covered because uh, the, the, that template uh, that you have shown in the presentation, uh, it will lead me through to write my own disaster management plan, to write my own uh, data management plan. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, thank you very much for your response. All right. All right, I will now proceed to cover the second tool, Sun Scholar Data. As I mentioned, this is the Unwashed University's Institutional Research um, Data Repository. This is the interface of the repository itself, and this is what the user accounts look like. Now, I won't go into the details of the tool. We have separate sessions for such things, but what I wanted to cover is the fact that when you're actually using the tool, you actually have to prepare your data for publication. And once again, we'll go to the quality related aspect of resource data management. Generally speaking, you don't just take your data and then publish the data and that's it. You actually have to go through a checklist, ensure that your resource data have been checked for quality purposes, make sure that there are no errors. Um, you've actually, um, make sure that you've validated um, certain aspects of the research data. You really just want to make sure that there are no flaws or, um, or errors that are captured in the data. So you look at the manner in which the data were actually collected or generated, how you actually analyze the, the research data to make sure that um, your data would actually support your research findings. You want to make sure that there's some form of data documentation, for example, a readme file, uh, or it could be a data dictionary, laboratory notebook, um, there are different types of data documentation, but published research data must be accompanied by, by some form of data uh, documentation. The data have to be organized in a logical manner. There has to be some specific file name and convention that you would use that you should disclose, ideally in the data documentation. You should use some kind of open file format, so an open standard and lossless file format that would actually support reuse in the future. The data has uh, have to be described appropriately using some form of metadata. Now, this is something that you would do within the repository itself by completing an electronic submission form that I'll show you just now that allows you to complete the metadata associated with your research data. You also basically need to consider if the research data are sensitive in question, I mean, in nature. If the research data are sensitive due to data privacy reasons, Resource contract restrictions. It says if, um, if you, for example, if you had to complete or at least um, sign a non disclosure um, agreement, you wouldn't go and uh, publish your research data in a repository like this. 
And there could be intellectual property restrictions. For example, if there's a patent that's pending that's associated with your research project, you would not really want to ruin the chances of being granted that patent by prematurely publishing the research data in question. And I've basically mentioned the intellectual property um, rights issue right there, but you have to make sure that the rights do belong, at least in this case, to Stellenbosch University in order for a researcher to publish the research data. You also have to um, consider if the research data, if the rights don't um, belong to Stellenbosch University, but you do have the right to make use of the data, for instance, if there's a Creative Commons attribution license that allows you to reuse the data, then that's perfectly fine. Then you have to look at the most appropriate license to use. If you're working with software, you'd use a software related license as opposed to a data license. And if you're working with resource data, you'd use a Creative Commons attribution license. We have this built in within the tool, so we make the decision very, very simple for researchers. And then we'll look at the type of settings. So if your data need to be placed under embargo momentarily, let's say for a year to allow you as a researcher to publish your research data, that is an option. But generally speaking, if the data are published, then obviously they're openly accessible because the repository is an openly is an open access repository. And if the data are then published in that case, what you have is a case of open data that also complied with fair data principles due to the fact that the data were actually managed in accordance with the best practices and principles associated with the research data management. Now, if you look at the metadata fields, this is what it looks like when you complete the online submission form. You add in fields such as the title of the data set, the author of the or creators of the data set, the categories that this would fall into, um, Keywords. So the example here is a, it's a data set associated with weather observations. So the category would be meteorology and the keywords would be things such as weather, weather considerations, meteorology, could even have climate as a keyword. And then the item type, be, for example, is it software, is it an image, is it an audio visual file, or is it a data set? Then you'd have a short description of the data set and then you'd select the license. Then the academic group, in this case, that will be your academic faculty. And then if it's an externally hosted data set, you'd add a DOI. But other than that, some scholar data will automatically generate the DOI, which is a, pers a persistent identifier that facilitates um, the findability or discoverability of the research data in question. So if the research data are actually published, then this is what you'd see. Here's an example of a publicly accessible data set. And what you find is that it has two files, two data files, and the readme file, which is the data documentation. Remember I pointed out that for quality purposes, the data files must be accompanied by some form of data documentation. And this is a readme text file that serves as an example of um, data documentation. And then these are the metadata fields that were completed for this specific data set that actually show up publicly as well. So you see that this is an example of open data, openly accessible data. And you see that from a quality perspective, the data do have um, rich metadata in this sense. There's also a license here, and there is a DOI associated with the data set. In order to access it, you'd have to click the site button in order to find it, or at least in order to view it. So let's look at how, or at least the manner in which some scholar data ensures compliance with the fair, um, the elements of the fair data principles. Firstly, there's an aspect of data appraisal. So we don't just publish research data on the repository uh, automatically after submissions of data sets are submitted, or at least made for publication purposes. We actually then subject the research data to review process. So in terms of data appraisal, uh, the appraisal itself serves the purpose of assessing the suitability of the submissions for publication purposes on the repository. And this entails reviewing several aspects relating to the submission, such as the nature of the data, the security of the files, file formatting, file organization, the presence of appropriate data documentation, the accuracy of the metadata fields completed by researchers in order to describe their research data. As you can see, these are quality related attributes associated with the research data. And then perhaps more importantly, the appraisal process serves the purpose of verifying whether or not the publication of the research data will give rise to disclosure risks. So we'll be looking at things such as intellectual uh, property violations, 
data privacy violations. Essentially, we want to ensure that the resource data are not sensitive in nature and that they can actually be published. And in addition to that, there's the metadata enrichment part. That's the second phase of the review process. This entails the addition of descriptive information to the submitted content in order to facilitate its future discoverability and reuse. This is basically the application of control vocabulary to the metadata. And if you look at the fair data principles, that generally addresses the interoperability aspect. Then there's the long term archive of storage where we'd actually store the resource data for the long term and ensure that other people can find the data because the data have to be stored somewhere. But in this case, the data can be queried by using an, on, an online search. And we provide access to the resource data so anyone can conduct a search. They'll find the data via the Sun Scholar data um, interface and they'll access the resource data. This obviously facilitates the reuse of the resource data. If people can find the data, then they can make use of them. Obviously, there's no guarantee that each and every single resource data set that has been located would actually be reused, but this increases the chances that that will occur. Then I want to move on to the actual tools that you can use after you've published the resource data sets in order to assess the degree to which the data sets actually comply with the FAIR data principles. The first tool we'll look at is the Fuji Automated FAIR Data Assessment Tool. And the way it works is that um, you basically get the DOI for your published data set and you basically click a button. You click here to access the data set, I mean to assess the data set. You'd insert the DOI, the link associated with your data set, and then you start the FAIR assessment. This takes less than a minute and the score is generated. With the example that you see on the screen here, there's a report that actually shows a percentage score. In this case, it's a 54% pretty so it's pretty, just pretty much an average data set in this case. The fair level is described as being moderate. And if you look at the findabilities, moderate, six out of seven. The accessibility aspect received a score of one out of three. Um, the interoperability aspect, two out of four, so that's moderate, and the reusability was four out of ten. So the data set scored poorly for accessibility as well as reusability to a large degree. And there's even a breakdown for each of these um, fair data principles. So you can actually have a look at what went wrong with regards to findability, or accessibility, interoperability, and reusability if you're using this tool. The other tool that can be used is the FAIR Evaluator tool. And it works in a similar manner. Um, so it's a bit more granular in terms of what you can access. So you can simply assess the fair, the fairness of the data, the accessibility aspect, the interoperability aspect, as well as the usability aspect. You can do these separately, or you can actually um, assess all of the FAIR data principles collectively. You um, actually have to um, select that. Um, if you look at where this arrow points to, number one, you'd actually indicate the maturity indicators that you're looking for. You'd add the DOI for the data set. Um, you'd add your ORC ID, and then um, you'd put in the title of the evaluation and then run the evaluation, or least the assessment. This takes us a minute as well, and then it generates the results. In this case, um, this was an assessment particularly for the findability aspect of this data set, and the green um, I'm going to call it the green circles indicate um, the points or at least the aspects that actually generated positive scores, whereas the red ones would indicate low scores um, in this sense. And if you were to click on each of these, you'd actually get some more information that it um, describes the reasons as to why the data set was actually awarded a high score or poor score. In this case, I selected one of those components that actually had a poor score, that was the identifier of persistence. And what it indicates is that that data set did not really have a link that was actually persistent, and that's why it actually received a poor score. Or at least if there was a persistent link, what it states that the metadata, GUID, that is globally, identif um, globally unique identifier, does not conform with any known permanent URL system. Let's piece this all together. Um, I think that the easiest way of piecing this all together is if I was to quickly run through an example of how this would actually work out. 
So with that, I just quickly want to go to this file here and show you. Here's an example of um, a folder that actually has uh, an Excel spreadsheet here. I've saved this as a CSV file, to, um, to be honest, and it has a readme file as data documentation. And since we don't have too much time left, I, I won't really go into the data management planning aspects, but let's assume that there was a data management plan associated with this project and it was generated, which was the example I showed you previously. And then you'd go to um, Sound Scholar Data the repository in order to upload and publish the data set. So I've already completed this information. Weather Observation Stone Bosch University Library is the title of the data set. And if we have a look at that, what we would see is that this data set has been published and um, or at least I've completed the information in terms of the nature of the data set. The item title, I've selected some metadata fields already, tags, climate and weather, categories or climatology, there's meteorology as well as climate change science not classified elsewhere. I've put in a short description that says that this is a data set related to a fictitious research project used for demonstration purposes only. So I'm filling in the minimum um, metadata that actually needs to be completed. And I will then proceed to submit this for review purposes. And I will then select submit. It says that your item is currently pending review. And then what I will do is I will then have to go in the system and then review the data set. So let's just have a look here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to publish the data set. And what I'll show you is that if you were to have a look at the interface in Sun Scholar data, you won't see the data set here. But what I want to do is I actually want to publish it. However, due to data privacy um, reasons, I don't want to publicly disclose or at least show who submitted their data for publication purposes because their personal identifiers will be revealed. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to shortly, very shortly, I'm going to stop sharing and then I'll publish the data set and then I'll share my screen again. So I'm now publishing the data set. And once it's public, I'll let everyone know. All right, I have basically signed the data set to myself and I'm going to now share my screen once again. All right, so here's the data set right now. And um, I trust you can all see this. I'm now going to approve and publish the data set. And that has been published. So if I was to now refresh this page, I will see, at least I should see the data set quite soon. And there it is, publicly available. And if I click on that, I can see the metadata fields that I completed. And if I click the site button, I see that it has a DOI. So what I'll do is I'll copy that DOI and then I'll go to the Fuji Automated Fair Data Assessment Tool. And um, in fact, let's start like this. There it is. You click on that. Click on the link. I don't want to go through all that. I'll go directly to the tool itself. And you click here to assess the data set. I'll click that button. And all I have to do is enter that DOI. So I copied and pasted that. And I'll start the fair assessment. So let's just wait a couple of seconds for the report to be generated. Now this is a mock data set, so I wouldn't expect spectacular results, but nevertheless, it shows that the fair um, level is actually described as being moderate in this case, which doesn't seem too bad. Um, you can go to the detail about the findability, accessibility, reusability, as well as interoperability aspects. But the findability has a advanced rating, seven out of seven. There's two out of three for accessibility, three out of four for interoperability, five out of 10 for reusability. And one could actually drill down into more detail to find out why certain things were wrong. Like in this case, this option was um, associated with metadata is incomplete. 
So what I want to point out is that for each subsection, you can actually get more information as to why you received a poor score. So this is a good way of actually finding out the, about the degree to which your data set actually um, complies with uh, the fair data principles. A similar thing can also be done with the fair maturity, um, sorry, with the fair evaluator tool. So I've already opened it up here. What you would do is you'd uh, select the evaluate resources option. So you'd get started with that. And what you do is you basically can select to have a look at the findability aspect or the accessibility aspect only. In this case, I will select all of the indicators um, that I can look at. So I'll look at all the maturity indicators except for searchability. Um, I'll add in the same DOI that I use. Um, weather observations would be the um, title of the data set. And I've already um, added my what I call it work ID. I, I ran this evaluation before the presentation just to make sure that it worked obviously. And if we were to run this evaluation, we would then see the results. Sam, um, while it's running, sorry, mm -hmm. um, there's about three minutes left. Mm -hmm. um, we do not have a session immediately after your session, so I imagine we could add a minute or two. All right, thank you very much. I'm, I'm almost done. Once this shows the results, then I'll basically conclude. Um, it's just it's taken a while in this case. There is okay. one quick. One oh, yeah. question then also just that you need to answer. Sure. Go ahead. What's the question? Um, sometimes these grants ended long ago, but samples and data are in use. For PhD studies nested in big grants, does this mean that the PhD data sharing plan should actually be feeding into the grant DMP despite the approvals to use the grant data? Um, yeah, I, I, I ideally, if I understand that correctly, um, let me just have a look at that question. Um, Ms. Namuganga. Where is that at? Is it this one here? Yeah, um, so. But the, the data sharing plan is something that would actually pop up at the end of um, the research project to a large degree. You would obviously within the DMP um, indicate the manner in which you would share your research data so that even after the project has come to an end, people would be able to access your research data. But that has to be planned in advance and included in your data management plan. Now, after the project has ended, let's say if you put the data in a repository, then you could actually indicate up. You'd have, let's say, a data access, I'm going to call it a statement. But for the data sharing part specifically, that should definitely be in the TMP. Thank um, you, sir. Yeah, it Thank wouldn't you, be a separate statement, though. Um, so let's just have a brief look here. These are the results associated with that data set that I showed you. It doesn't give a percentage score. It ran 21 tests, 15 were successful, six failed. And if you scroll down here, you can see what's green is good, what's red is bad. And you can obviously have a look at the detailed aspects to understand why things were wrong. Um, personally, I think that if you had to pick between these tools, the Fuji tool, the Fuji Automated Fair Data Assessment Tool is actually a simpler tool to use. It's more straightforward and it gives you a percentage that's easier to actually understand compared to the Fair Evaluator Tool, but I felt the need to show you that there's at least more than one tool that you could use. Now, if we then go back to the presentation now, I'm going to conclude now that we've pieced it all together. Um, so the key takeaways, and there's several, are that firstly, uh, research data management is not the same thing as open science. Research data management is a process which entails planning and controlling for the manner in which research data are treated during and after a research project. Research data management has a quality management aspect. Research data management actually serves a quality management function while also contributing to the openness of research data. One of the goals of research data management is to facilitate the use of data by people other than those involved in the original collection, management, and analysis. 
not all resource data can be made open accessible. That's important to understand. And there's more. Research data can be made open and accessible in a variety of ways, which I described during the presentation. Research data that are open and accessible are classified as open data, but the term open data doesn't only apply to research data. It can also apply to things such as open government data. Research data management best practices dictate that open data should comply with the fair data principles, which is why I showed you several tools that can facilitate this process. And there are several tools that can be used in order to ensure that open data actually do comply with the fair data principles. And I showed you at least four tools, the data source wizard, some scholar data, and the evaluation tools, the Fuji automated fair data assessment tool, as well as the fair evaluator tool. And basically that brings us to an end. These are the contact details if you, in case you want to reach me, as well as my division research data services, or you can also contact me via the research ICT service desk. Thank you, Nkosi, Danki. Are there any questions? Thank you so much, Sam. Um, I think we've covered all the questions that um, was asked via the chat. Um, is there anybody else who would like to pose a question to Sam before we end the session? No, Sam, uh, there are no, no more questions. Um, you did an excellent job. Um, wait, I see, wait, I see another hand, yes. You can unmute yourself and pose a question. Uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> uh, morning, colleagues. Well, I don't have a question. I just want to emphasize that uh, with all Sam has just explained, you don't have to do it alone. You can always reach out to Sam and myself. We'll just have to take you through the process if we have to, and also guide you in terms of how you document your data to make sure that it complies with the fair, fair data principles. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cesare. <laughs> Alvina, if I may, there's a question here that I just saw that was asked about being able to recall data. So I think um, there's a question that says, can I recall data? that I made publicly available before, assuming interrogating the data is creating interesting findings that may require patenting and licensing of source in the field. Well, yes, it is possible to um, recall publicly, um, published um, what are called previously published resource data. So for example, before the session, I published this data set that you just saw, and then I actually unpublished it. Now, in my case, it didn't have any disastrous effects, but what I want to point out if that is that if your research data are actually associated with a patent, something like that, that, that could have disastrous consequences because if the data have been published and have been crawled by Google or any web crawlers, then the information has already been disseminated. It would actually undermine the patent in that case because a patent has to be associated with a novel finding. It can't be novel if it's already been published. So that would undermine the ability to have the patent. But if there are minor issues, as to say someone states that you've stolen their resource data or there's some kind of plagiarism issue we can certainly unpublish the data so unpublishing data is possible the ramifications would really um, depend on the situation um, licensing issues there, there could be some penalties even though the data can be unpublished but it is possible to unpublish the data using some scholar data thank you sam i see there's a hand um giovanni Please unmute yourself and go ahead. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thanks Sam, for the, this wonderful uh, presentation. I just want to to find out. Uh, I know it's 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 good for us to publish the data, but uh, uh, what would you say uh, is or are the benefit for the researcher or for the department of publishing the actual data, if uh, any? Uh, thank you. So. There, there are several um, benefits, so it depends on also how you publish your um, your data. To um, to a large degree, um, first of all, you're complying with um, good data management practices, so you have good quality data. You're contributing to um, the generation of knowledge, so that's not only evident um, through outputs such as um, journal articles, etc. But the other thing is that um, 
for instance, not everyone collects their research data from scratch. They will make use of secondary data, and the data has to actually come from somewhere. Um, in this case, you will be contributing to, to um, something like that. And this has some spin-off effects. For instance, um, it can lead to uh, resource collaborations, um, for one thing. Um, so if you publish your research data and you publish a journal article, especially if the data are published let's say in a data paper that is peer reviewed, there is a chance, and it might not be the case in certain South Africa, but there's a chance that you've got two publications, so you've killed two birds with one research project um, in that sense. The other thing has to then do with, um, just want to look at the other benefit. Mm, contribution to the field publications. Oh, research grants. There are funders who actually demand that researchers or staff have a mandate that researchers should publish their data um, in the future. If you have a track record that you've actually published your data in the past, that's one way of actually um, motivating that you should actually receive certain grants as opposed to someone who's actually um, who's actually not done that. There is um, a, a there's an argument that could be made that you're basically contributing to the larger pool of um, research that actually exists there. I'll give you um, a good example, for instance, um, it has to do with COVID-19. When the pandemic started, it was very hard to come by um, research uh, data, or any data associated with um, that SARS-CoV-2 um, um, virus. But there are several research data sets that were generated by researchers, and the only way that most people could access this was if the data sets were actually made publicly available. And that is something that was actually done, and it contributed to the um, creation, or at least development of vaccines in a relatively short period of time. And there are other examples of this, for instance, if you look at the, um, the Human Genome Project, which also relied on um, publicly available uh, research data that was made available by researchers, other than just looking at it inwardly in terms of how does this actually help me as an individual researcher, I'd say you should also look at how it actually helps um, broader society at large. I personally believe that it contributes to the um, human species as a whole, more so than an individual researcher. Um, perhaps that's a bit of an idealist uh, thought, but um, I do believe that research tends to build on another research and the research data are the foundation or at least some um, the port support structure that support the research fi um, findings. Um, I hope that actually um, answers um, your question in, in that sense. That's a motivation to share your data. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. It's really clear. Thanks for that uh, uh, response. Thanks a lot. It's very clear. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, thank you, Sam. Thank you, everybody, for attending this session. Um, we are officially ending this session and would like to thank Sam very much for sharing uh, and enlightening us about open data and the research data management um, practices and services uh, being rendered and offered at Stellenbosch University. Um, we are now um, ending and then there are still two more sessions for the rest of the day. At 10.30 we will have Academic Writing Integrity and Turn It In by Alison Bouchard and then at 11.30 we will be talking about self-care and mental health um, by Almarie Kruger. So please join us again at 10.30. Um, for the Turn It In and Academic Writing session. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.